many philosophical and religious traditions exalt suffering. Suffering and loss are considered the twin engines of personal growth and development, even enlightenment. They are the catalysts without which evolution is impossible. They are the fuel that runs life. Without suffering, it seems we are as good as dead. It's an ironic twist connecting suffering to life, pain to love, hurt to growth. And yet it underlies many traditions, not only in religion and literature and philosophy, but also in psychology. And this is the topic of today's video. Why do we love to suffer and pursue suffering? And apropos suffering, <laughs> my name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, the long-suffering former visiting professor of psychology in Southern Federal University, and currently a member of the faculty of SIAPS. Suffering. There are many forms of suffering, and this is the first problem we face, a lexical problem, an issue of definition. What constitutes one person's suffering is perceived by another to be elating or satisfying or gratifying. Pain is sometimes perceived as a positive experience by many. And so it's very difficult to reach a consensus as to what constitutes suffering. But a good enough definition would be that suffering is an existential, circumstantial experience or environment that induce in one bad feelings and the need or wish to flee, to run away, to escape, to avoid the source of suffering or the source of pain. Suffering and loss and pain and hurt seem to be addictive most of us engage in behaviors which are self-destructive, self-defeating, self-trashing, and self-punitive. And these behaviors yield, they lead to suffering, and yet we don't stop. We keep doing the same thing over and over again. Sigmund Freud called it repetition compulsion. And yet, why would we do that? It runs against every common sense, every grain of, of truth, and every evolutionary theory. Why would, we, why would we undermine ourselves, sabotage ourselves, punish ourselves, hate and loathe ourselves? Why would we trash ourselves? Why would we do these things? What in suffering renders it a drug of choice? an addiction, something which motivates us, drives us forward, defines us, elevates us, excites us, something which we cannot do without, something that is indispensable, loss, suffering, hurt and pain. Before we proceed, this video is not about trauma bonding. If you search the channel, you'll find five videos dedicated to the topic of trauma bonding, and I was very loath to make a sixth one. This is not about trauma bonding, which is actually not a form of suffering. It's a form of self-harm. But this is about the generalized human condition of being in pain, being ill at ease, being discomfited, egosyntonic, self-rejecting, self-negating, hate, self-hating and self-loathing, and in short, feeling uncomfortable within one's own skin, usually coupled with pain and hurt. The first reason that suffering proves to be so irresistible, the etiology, the cause of our repetitive behavior in pursuing suffering, securing suffering, 
inflicting suffering and loss on ourselves is the fact that suffering is safe. Suffering is safe. <laughs> Think about it. It sounds counterintuitive. Suffering is not safe. Suffering is hurtful. Suffering is painful. Suffering leads to disintegration and dysfunction. How could it be safe? Suffering is a secure base. It is safe because it is predictable. It is familiar. And above all, it is ritualized. We engage in rituals of suffering, sometimes built into religious practices. And so suffering is a secure base. It's a mother substitute, a maternal substitute. It is the big womb. When we suffer, we cease to be. It's as if we have regressed back to the womb, back to mother's womb. Suffering annihilates us, negates us. Suffering renders us non-existent in many ways. And because it is usually recurrent, repetitive, regular, it is also, as I said, predictable and familiar and feels safe. You know the ropes, you know the rules, you know what to expect, you know who is going to be the source of the pain and what is going to be the source of frustration. You can anticipate everybody's next move. It's like choreography, like a kabuki theater where everyone has a script and people follow the lines and then converge in the place of suffering, in the watering hole of eternal loss. And so suffering feels like, ironically and paradoxically, suffering feels like a safe place to be. We have a name for that in clinical psychology. Suffering is a comfort zone. Next, I mentioned that suffering is self-punitive. It's a form of self-inflicted punishment. Now, many of us are masochists, and many of us have what is known as an internalized bed object. A series of voices, a series of introjects, which keep informing us that we are unworthy, we are bad, we are unlovable, we don't deserve the best in life, we are failures, we are losers, we are ugly, we are stupid, etc., etc., this coalition, coalitions, coalition of voices, this group collective of introjects, known as the bad object, pushes us to punish ourselves. If we are not lovable, we are going to make sure that we are never loved. If we regard ourselves as losers and unworthy and inadequate, we are going to ascertain our own failure and defeat. We validate the bad object because the bad object usually are the voices of mother, father, and influential peers and role models such as teachers. In order to not conflict with the bad object, in order to avoid a dissonance with the bad object, we validate the bad object. We prove the bad object right by behaving in a way which is self-destructive, in ways which are self-defeating, by undermining and sabotaging ourselves, in short, by punishing ourselves. Suffering is a mode of communication. It's a language. It's a signal. We tell the bad object, you see, we are suffering. You are right. Don't attack us from within. We are doing the job for you. We are attacking ourselves. You don't need to punish us. We tell mother's voice. We tell father's voice. We tell our teacher's voice. You don't need to punish us. We are punishing ourselves. Suffering is a way to silence the negative voices inside our mind. 
to deactivate or disable the bad object. It is a form of virtue signaling. We are signaling to the bad object that we are virtuous by self-flagellating, by self-humiliating, by self-punishing, by self-shaming, by self-failing, by self-loathing and rejecting and hating. We are telling the bad object, you're no longer needed. We are virtuous. We, we are good now. We are good because we punish the bed. We are the bed. And so we are punishing ourselves. And by punishing ourselves, we become good. Um, suffering and loss, especially self-inflicted suffering and loss, are forms of expiating, purging, cleansing, form of its penance. A penance that indicates and signifies repentance. And so there's a process, as I said, of cleansing, cathartic process. Suffering and loss, in many cases, are perceived as rewarding, not as negative, but as positive. The more you suffer, the more you have lost, the more elevated you are the more exalted you are, the more saintly, the more angelic, the more blemishless, the more pure you are. Indeed, in most religious traditions and in many philosophies, suffering is associated with purity, with sainthood. That's why we have the concept of a martyr, a Christian martyr, as the, the concept of shihada in Islam, the Muslim martyr. Martyrdom, self-sacrifice, self-negation, self-annihilation, they're all forms of expiation, purging and cleansing, but also of elevating oneself morally. So suffering and loss lead to rewards. They're gratifying. They're gratifying. The world is a morality play of good versus evil and by choosing to castigate yourself to flagellate yourself to punish yourself to accept suffering and loss as both inevitable and welcome by doing this you align yourself on the side of good versus evil and you become instantaneously morally superior Having endured suffering and loss, one acquires gradually the identity of a victim. Victimhood identity is now in vogue. It's in fashion. Everyone and his dog and his mother-in-law are victims looking for abusers. And so victimhood identity sits well with the need to suffer and to endure loss. Your credentials as a victim depend crucially on how much suffering you have experienced and how, mu how much loss you have absorbed. So the more inclined you are to self-identify as a victim, the more likely you are to be addicted to suffering and loss, to seek them out, to bring them upon yourself, to generate circumstances environments and to work with people who are likely to mistreat you and abuse you and exploit you and punish you because then you will have become a superior victim a victim with an impressive portfolio of suffering and loss victimhood pays victimhood is a profitable business when you are a victim you enjoy rights and these rights impose obligations on other people to compensate you, for example, to support you, to provide you with succor and help, including material help. You are entitled. Victimhood as an identity is a form of narcissistic entitlement. And so this again contributes to the allure 
and the attractiveness of suffering and loss, especially in today's world, where in order to move ahead in life and to be upwardly socially mobile, you need to be a victim. Only victims prosper and thrive in postmodern society, which is founded on victimhood as an organizing principle, according to, soci according to the sociologist Campbell and to the uh, pro and to Professor Vakni. <laughs> so there are many studies that show that victimhood is fast becoming um, the main route to success. And there's no victimhood without suffering and loss. I mentioned earlier that in many philosophical and religious traditions, suffering and loss go hand in hand with personal growth, development, identity formation, and enlightenment. In other, in other words, everything that is good in psychology, in personal psychology, everything that is good in the individual trajectory of becoming a better version of yourself, everything is associated with suffering and loss. You can't progress in life, you can't advance, you can't evolve, you can't become a better version of yourself without suffering and loss. There is no free lunch. Everything has a cost. And the more egregious the cost, the more extreme, the more outlandish the pain and the suffering, the more unique you are. In other words, our attachment to loss, our addiction to suffering, is the flip side of our growing narcissism as a civilization. Because suffering and loss make us special, make us unique. And then our grandiosity is justified. Look how, how much I've suffered. Look how amazingly brutish my abuser has been. No one has suffered like me. No one has had an abuser uh, worse than mine. It's what we call competitive victimhood. Put all these together, and you're beginning to see why suffering and loss is not such a bad thing <laughs> in the eyes of many people, and why it is addictive, because it feels safe, predictable, familiar, because it's ritualized and so intimately connected with religion or with religious practices or with a religion-like, a religious-like mind because it is self-punitive and we, we, many of us possess a bad object, a set of voices that tell us how unworthy and unlovable and worthy of punishment we are. So by punishing ourselves, we silence the bad object and that is definitely addictive because the bad object is intolerable, unbearable and anything, anything that silences it is better than the bad object, is perceived as a positive instrument. Uh, suffering and loss resonate with our introjects, our self-punitive, self-hating, self-rejecting introjects. Suffering and loss expiate, purge, cleanse us, make, make us pure, allows us to repent and reform and become better versions of ourselves. Suffering and loss, therefore, have their own rewards. Morality is founded on suffering and loss. So we become better moral creatures, morally superior. We attain the high moral ground via suffering and loss. Finally, suffering and loss is associated with victimhood. And victimhood is a strategy, a coping strategy, which ensures and guarantees upward social mobility, new rights and commensurate obligations on others and entitlement. Suffering and loss, therefore, have come to represent a viable, a viable path to attaining your goals and accomplishments and the development of your personality and your personal growth and enlightenment. And even in um, in writings like
in writers, when you read books by writers like Jordan Peterson and so on and so forth, suffering is extolled and praised again as a viable strategy. As long as we live in a world where we are besieged by negative messaging from others, especially meaningful, significant others, like fathers, mothers, teachers, role models, influential peers, social media. As long as we live in a world where victimhood is the way to go, and more or less the only viable coping strategy and guarantee success. As long as we live in such a civilization which is narcissistic and rewards uniqueness and ent or entitlement and grandiosity, then suffering and loss will become organizing principles, will make sense, help us make sense of the world and of our lives and imbue everything with meaning. Indeed, suffering and loss are often confused for meaning. When people try to make sense of their lives, when they try to introduce meaning into their lives or to immerse their lives in meaning, they misconstrue and misidentify suffering and loss as meaningful. Suffering and loss are mislabeled as meaning, when actually suffering and loss are destructive. They're the exact opposite of meaning. They're nihilistic. The elevation and idolizing of suffering and loss, they are forms of nihilism, the rejection of life and everything that life can give us that is joyful and leads to contentment and happiness. And so as long as we live in a world that celebrates death and destruction, a death cult which elevates material goods above the lives of people, suffering and loss will be with us as the twin idols. And the idolatry of suffering and loss will replace, will have replaced all true life-affirming philosophies and religions.